Hello students, welcome back to a discussion of chapter 4. Uh, we're going through the straw man approaches. The last one is the naive immor immoralist. Basically, as it says there, asserts that if a manager of a multinational sees that firms from other nations are not following ethical norms in that host nation, that the manager should not either. So this is akin to um, saying or being told by your parents, uh, one's mother that, hey, if everyone's jumping off the bridge, are you going to jump off the bridge too? Uh, I'm not sure if you were all given that same motherly advice when asked to do something that uh, she didn't want you to do, but basically that is the naive immoralist. Um, it's just a downward you know, cycle because if everyone sees everyone else not be acting ethically, they're going to start not acting ethically and it just gets worse and worse. Uh, this is the whole child labor issues as well as the drug lord problems um, evident in some countries that if you're paying off a drug lord or you're receiving um, assistance or help or protection from a drug lord, then, or if others are doing that, then, you know, you should do that too. Or if you are kind of... Um, watching what your competitors are doing and they are being assisted by that drug lord um, uh, that gives that would give you permission to do that under this straw man approach so those are the four approaches as, as I said um, uh, th they come up quite heavily in the exams and on the quizzes that uh, you'll be doing for this chapter utilitarian ethics and can Kantian ethics, um, two different ethical approaches, uh, utilitarian approaches hold that the moral worth of actions or practices are determined by their consequences. So this is basically the cost-benefit approach um, to uh, deciding if something is ethical. Is there more benefit than cost? If so, then it's ethical. Um, does not consider justice. Um, it's difficult to measure benefits and costs to some degree and of course um, has a risk, various risks of that course of action. It's very difficult to, to put on a cost-benefit approach. Um, does not consider uh, justice. Basically it's looking for the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Minority groups may be the ones paying the cost. Uh, for these type of ethical approaches. Um, consider an example that, say, a nation wants to keep their health care costs down, so the government decides to screen people for H1V. And uh, those that test positive are denied insurance. Well, um, this approach would say, well, it's going to benefit more people because health care costs will come down. It's going to there's going to be a little cost to some people who won't be able to get insurance. Uh, but the overall benefits outweigh the risks or the costs, so utilitarian ethics, Kantian ethics would, uh, would support this. So this process basically um, promotes, you know, benefiting a great deal of people over um, a small group. Kantian ethics, Immanuel Kant, um, people should be treated as ends and never purely as means to the ends of others. People have dignity and need to be respected. People are not machines. Um, employing people in sweatshops, making them work long hours or low pay and poor work, uh, poor working conditions would be um, unethical. Child labor, working conditions in developing nations, of course, um, would not be um, appropriate. Um, what this ethical approach, Kantian ethics, it's it's incomplete because um, it basically states, you know, um, low pay or child labor, um, poor working conditions, uh, not appropriate, not ethical, but how do we define child labor? Um, we can't just take the child out of work if the child in that nation needs work to support, help support a family. If they're being exploited, that's one thing, uh, but, you know, we all worked as children. And if we look back uh, generations ago, our grandparents and great-grandparents all worked in very unethical conditions in, in Canada on various family farms. 
what would happen if, if a more advanced nation at that time came and basically told our great-great-grandparents that their children could not work on the family farm? Um, you know, what would happen to our nation? So I'm not uh, in I'm not supporting exploitive child labor, of course, but that just kind of is one of the dilemmas faced with with this type of Kantian ethics. Is it's it's incomplete. It doesn't help us address really uh, serious dilemmas. So some um, other theories. Oops. Let's go back. The rights theories. Um, where am I here? Developed in the uh, 20th century, rights establish a minimum level level of morally acceptable acceptable behavior. So we have the moral compass that uh, guides us as managers and people uh, when making uh, decisions, which could have an ethical um, component. Um, the uh, United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights would be a rights theory stating that there's a minimum level of rights that people should have. And there's uh, many different parts to this Universal Declaration. Some of it comes to the right to work, to free cho choice of employment, to just and favorable, favorable working conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. In Canada, we have employment insurance, so that protects us against unemployment. Um, everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work, and there's other factors listed in this Universal Declaration of Human Rights by, so, um, created by the United Nations. Um, justice theories, let's bring this down. Um, justice theories focuses on the attainment of a just distribution of economic goods and services. Just does not mean fair and equal. Um, so it is, well, it says that it does, but it really does not mean equal in terms of everyone's getting an equal amount. Uh, you can have um, you will have situations, as um, per supported by uh, John Rawls, another um, theorist within this justice theory, basically saying you can have uh, an unequal dis uh, distribution when it works to everyone's advantage. So that's why I mean it's it's not you know every, here's the, here's a pie and we're all going to divide it up equally. Uh, there's going to be in in most world situations, real situations, there's going to be an unequal distribution of that. So it is it um so that distribution is considered fair and equitable because some people may have more, but because they have more, uh it does help everyone out. Uh if you go more into this uh theory, there's that veil of ignorance exists that basically blind us to the uh various characteristics that we have, that people have, other people have, basically allowing us to um have that unequal distribution based on um, um, based on merit or based on the fact that we're going to use it um, or us having more or less basically uh, um, just allows the economy and people um, to to grow and, and develop better than they would if uh, we didn't have that unequal distribution. So this comes out in terms of, you know, you may have unequal distribution because you got some people who have, are more innovative or have more entrepreneurship ability. They're the ones who are going to go out and um, perhaps find that one product or service that everyone wants. And of course, they're going to benefit from it, but so of course is everyone else in the community. Um, so that is where John Rawls and other theorists have um, have basically directed this justice theory, basically with the understanding that you know um, a rising tide um, lifts all boats, even the most poor boats. So this is where his theory is uh, is coming from. 
So we can have that unequal distribution because that, you know, uh, stronger economy does lift up everybody. Um, and that's what the distinction we have to make here is that we look at the the benefit to the um, poorest member within the community. Are they, have they been benefited to some degree? May not be equal, but are they still better off uh, because of this unequal distribution? And if the answer is yes, then they would argue that it is um, ethical to um, have that unequal distribution. Um, continuing on, this last few slides are basically how we can uh, make better hiring or better decision-making processes for our um, for the various corporations. I want to go to the last little bit. Um, just some information here to read. Let's go to the CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. It talks about four different stances corporations can make uh, or have made um, when faced with um, difficult situations. So the obstructionist stance um, is when a business makes it difficult for customers to effectively complain about some unethical situation or problem. So how they make it difficult is that perhaps there's excessive paperwork or perhaps you have to call in and go through all of the process of finding the right person to talk to, you know, for, um, you know, to be able to, to complain or raise a, raise a point about some um, unethical situation. Or they simply deny the release of information. Um, or make it very timely to get. A defensive stance um, is not as confrontational as the obstructionist, but still a negative response. Basically, the corporation will say it wasn't our fault, and they try to make the customer believe that nothing can be done. So that's how some firms can behave or act when faced with difficult situations. They can obstruct it, they can become defensive, uh, or they can become perhaps more corporate, so corporate social responsible by having an accommodative stance. This is exhibited by firms that not only meet the standards expected, but go further. So they exceed customer expectations when faced with a problem. So a customer comes in there with an ethical problem or something that did not work with their product or their service, and the company is going to go above and beyond. So a proactive stance is one step further, is when companies proactively reach out to customers. They tell them in advance. They, know, they find out that there's something wrong with their product or their service, and they send out notes, memos, emails, whatever information to get out there, basically saying, hey, if you bought this in the last six months, please come to us, and we will be happily to replace it. So you get this with um, um, recalls of various auto parts um, or... Um, you know, the uh, various health agencies will say that, hey, if you bought onions recently, uh, don't eat them. Um, they're going to make you sick. Um, so they are being more proactive in that. Of course, these are different ways that companies have and can act more socially responsible. A um, couple negative ones and some, uh, some positive ones in there. So that wraps up our discussion of Chapter 4 with ethics. Uh, the ethical strawman approaches, as I said, um, understanding to um, to the degree that they're presented, the uh, the various theories, uh, especially the justice and the rights theories, um, and then a little bit on the uh, CSR in this last slide. <laughs>